Hi everyone. Uh, this is Misael. I just I wanted to uh, a I wanted to welcome everybody. Uh, still, um, you know, Miami time. Uh, we're gonna wait a little bit longer. Uh, see if a couple people more uh, trickle in. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, we'll we'll start shortly. get started now. Uh, seems like it's a good, good number. Hi, everyone. I'm seeing some familiar faces here. Thanks for coming. It's good to, to virtually see you all. Um, yeah, so I am here uh, just south of the convention center of Miami Beach. Um, my name is Misael Soto, in case we haven't met before, and this is the Department of Reflections Field Work Dispatches, and this is dispatch number 38. Uh, can't believe we're up to 38 already. Amazing. Um, so just, you know, uh, to get a little bit people catched up, um, like I said, my name is Misael. I'm the, uh, the director of the Department of Reflection. Um, and I'm here at the Miami Beach Convention Center just right now, which is um, a very important site, but right now, key, a key site for uh, COVID-19 tests. Um, they're free, you can walk up um, just to, to the, I'm not quite sure actually how it works, but uh, yeah, you walk up uh, and, or drive up, I think most people drive up. Um, but yeah, it's one of the key sites uh, for our region. Um, now, just in case for the uninitiated, we're going to get into uh, the location in just a second, but I wanted to go over the Department of Reflection uh, itself, just in case you don't know. Um, so we're a post-governmental agency, uh, and we've been working with and presenting a foil or reflection uh, to municipal entities such as the city of Miami Beach. And this is, I think, in the shot, yeah, uh, this is the, the city's, um, city hall. Uh, just across the street from the convention center. Um, and we've been working with them since the, the summer of 2018. Uh, we collaborate internally with departments uh, within uh, that municipality and others. And we push and interrogate the direction of their work with the community while producing creative moments of exchange between the institution and the residents and kind of finding that middle ground, right? Uh, our hope is to provide clarity to important conversations, leading to new ways of seeing and perhaps even some solutions. Uh, it's kind of the, the spiel, right? If you want to learn more uh, about uh, the Department of Reflection, please visit the uh, departmentofreflection.org. And uh, while you're there, uh, sign up for the mailing list, of course. So for today's dispatch, we're on South Beach. We're back to kind of our founding uh, location, and we want to discuss uh, via site a pivotal moment in Miami Beach history. 
um, a, a moment that uh, was really important back then, but a lot of people have forgotten about it for, for whatever reason. I didn't really know about it until I started doing this research and digging around. It's, it's, it's really something. So, in, and that is in 1972, when both the Democratic and the Republican National Conventions took place here at the Convention Center in Miami Beach, in South Beach. Uh, so we're gonna spend some time here on that, in that location. We're gonna kind of walk around, we're gonna get to know the Convention Center. Uh, we're gonna check out uh, a couple of the streets where protests occurred. And we're gonna go to the park where all those protesters were camping out. Uh, and before I get into that, yeah, I just wanted to say, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. I mean, I think we're all really familiar with the way these formats work, but just in case you, you just find the, the comments section, uh, type those in and we'll, we'll, we'll try to get to as many of those as possible uh, by the end of the presentation. Okay, so let's get into it. So it's the year 2020 and these Republican and Democratic conventions uh, happened almost to two years to, to being a, a, a half a century, 50 years ago almost. So where do we start? So I, I would say, how about the site itself? Uh, I think it's of note to point out how the convention hall or the center itself which has changed and grown over the years. Uh, similar to a lot of other parts in, uh, especially this part of the beach on South Beach, uh, specifically as well to Lingo Park, which is the other kind of key location. We're gonna be kind of pivoting back and forth between those two locations. Uh, and I'll be headed there next. So you'll get to see that as well. Um, so the convention center has grown steadily. It's actually had three major renovations and expansions since then. It's always expanding, you know, in the name of, of, of civic progress, in the name of, of, of serving the residents. Uh, and back then it was known as the Miami Beach Exhibition Hall when it opened first uh, in the 50s. And it was the largest exhibition center in the South. Uh, and just to give you a sense, here's an image of, of what it looked like then. Back here. Mm -hmm. So, like I said, it's had three, three renovations since. And uh, here you have an image of, of what it looked like uh, during its uh, second, or actually its first expansion, which happened in, in 67. And this was uh, for the conventions that were gonna be taking place. So in 68, the uh, Democrats had, or rather, no, the Republicans had their convention here in Miami Beach while the Dems were in Chicago. And Chicago was just a mess. Uh, lots of protests that got really bloody. Um, and uh, so they, uh, the, the, the Republicans, or rather the Democrats, were really impressed with, with how Miami Beach handled it. So they all came, decided to come here. And it was one of only three times, and I think it's the last time since, that, that both uh, conventions happen in the same city. Um, and now this is the second uh, uh, expansion that took place. And this was happened in uh, 89, kind of a deco kind of situation. And um, it was a, a cost, uh, 80, uh, sorry, $92 million. Uh, of course, this was out, uh, deemed outdated uh, within a couple of years. And um, the commissioners and, and other politicians were trying to get an expansion throughout the 90s, and that only happened until recently. And so that's the building you see behind me, which is which cost this uh, taxpayer $620 million. Uh, and now we'll, we'll soon go under another kind of uh, smaller expansion to, to attach a hotel. Um, but anyways, um, what was I going to say? So we're gonna go take a look around the convention center uh, and note how the building has changed. And, 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 and yeah, we'll go from there. So if you bear with me, we're gonna go for a walk.
Uh, but uh, yeah, so it's now known as the Fillmore. It's one of the most popular concert sites in our in our uh, our area. But originally, it was the auditorium for the convention center. And oh, look, they're replacing the roof. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's still mostly the original architecture while the convention center has had many iterations. Um, so every, every time you get an, a, a change in the convention center, it just gets further and further away from, from this kind of uh, deco, uh, I think it would be deco inspired at that point. It was built in the 60s. Um, but Jackie Gleason, uh, famously was would film his show here uh, one of Nixon's uh, best pals that's a little sculpture to commemorate him and it's since uh, since been under private management and here behind us we have uh, the convention hall again But back in uh, 1972, uh, this side was the only uh, site uh, for, um, for entry. So this street here, uh, Washington Avenue, was the main artery uh, to block. And so this was filled with protests. So I guess while we're walking, if there's any questions in the chat, feel free to let me know. Uh, just type them in. Uh, oh, I see. Okay. Hi, Mary. Thanks for your question. Um, I I don't know if if Art Basel is happening this year. Yeah, um, I'm sure it's it's definitely a question at this time. Um, they. Um, Canceled Basel in Switzerland, so wouldn't be surprised. But uh, I guess we can just have to wait and see. I don't have any insider information. Sorry. Okay, let's see if um, we can get into. Oh, seems to be locked. Oh, I guess they're closed. Well, that's disappointing. Um, let's take a look. I mean, while we're here, I think it's really interesting the these, these kind of striations that they, they put up here totally a uh, kind of uh, architectural facade uh, not really doing anything as far as I know uh, it definitely livens up the the otherwise just kind of glass Jewel box situation of the rest of the building uh, behind it. Um, I think the jury's out on, for me personally, on how I feel about these. But um, yeah, so I think I think uh, for now that's, uh, that's 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 pretty good for the convention center. Um, so we're gonna um, take a uh, just a little quick kind of uh, break uh, and uh, I'm going to play a little clip here and when I'm back I'm going to be in Flamingo Park uh, so I'll see you in a sec. But political conventions attract more than delegates, politicians, newsmen and technicians. They also attract demonstrators. And Miami Beach prepared for them too. Areas of free speech and demonstration were designated. Campsites were provided, complete with health and sanitation facilities. 
By planning for these non-delegates, Miami Beach allowed the ventilation of different viewpoints that is essential in a democracy. Hello, everyone. Uh, uh, we're here now in uh, Flamingo Park. Uh, just uh, walked over here while that clip was playing. And uh, for those who don't know, I just wanted to go over a little bit of history, similar to how we just did at the convention center, just to give you an idea of where this place has been uh, and how it ties uh, to these 72 protests and uh, how we might be able to take elements that are here today uh, in the space and maybe uh, conjecture and theorize how these things have changed over time in direct correlation to those protests and other uh, events that have taken place. Uh, so originally this park opened in 1921 as a golf course uh, and that golf course was adjacent to uh, Carl Fisher's famous um, Flamingo Hotel. You can see a picture right here. And so this hotel was on the bay. Uh, so you see the, um, we would be west of Miami Beach in this image. And the golf course is the space just uh, kind of in the middle of the island right there in this image. And so that golf course opened in 21 with the hotel and it was only played on for, for five years. And the fate of not only the, this golf course and this open space, but all of Miami Beach and Miami and the region were tied to the September 18th devastating Great Miami Hurricane. And that hurricane destroyed so much of Miami and Miami Beach and the region and pretty much plunged the, the area into the Great Depression before the rest of the country. So with that, uh, the golf course was uh, turned over very, a couple months after that to the city of Miami Beach. And eventually the, the, the city purchased the land uh, for only $300,000 in 1929. So it's been a part of the city ever since. And since that moment, its role in the community, you could say has ebbed and flowed and changed and adapted according to the uh, needs of uh, residents. Uh, here we have another image uh, of how it was uh, zoned originally. And you can see here, that beyond the uh, golf course, there was also polo fields. Those polo fields are now which it's, it's it, what is uh, independent or, or private rather uh, housing. So we see that they just gave the, the golf course areas to the city. And, and, and since then, uh, you could say, um, like I said, it's changed quite a bit over time. What we see now today, is, is quite a built environment, very highly manicured uh, and very different than it was for, for, for quite a while. Uh, the um, now somewhat famous, especially uh, for baseball aficionados, the, uh, the grandstands and the, the baseball diamonds uh, just to the north that way uh, were, 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 are still intact. And those were uh, somewhat original to the park, as were a, um, an auditorium, which is now gone, as well as uh, the historic uh, tennis courts and um, paddle ball or uh, handball uh, courts that are just uh, behind me as well. The tennis courts are here. Uh, and these were renovated uh, not so not uh, rather recently, uh, maybe I think within the last decade, if my understanding is correct. Uh, but many other things have been added quite recently. Um, and you, you have to wonder how uh, and why uh, open areas have been limited further and further. I think it was interesting 
uh, because in 1972, uh, very few under a certain age, you, uh, you know, know about these protests of 72. Uh, but they were a significant moment, and many say a turning point, uh, not just the protests, of course, but the conventions, and altogether a real turning point for Miami Beach and uh, the region and the way the nation sees uh, Miami Beach, uh, ushering a, a really like a new era. Uh, protesters, although mostly in opposition to the Vietnam War, were from a diverse group and they were loosely organized. It's, it was a bit different kind of situation uh, but, um, than today, but in some ways it reminds me of the Occupy protests, um, which took up public space as well, um, and were a statement in that way. Uh, and although seemed upon first viewing that they were about a singular issue, in the case of Occupy, it was uh, broadly about income inequality, but they made space for related issues, such as like racism, outright structural racism, uh, campaign finance reform, uh, disability rights, uh, and other things. And, and you're, you, know, you, you kind of saw that here as well in, in 72, uh, in this in this uh, park, with um, many different uh, spaces for different kinds of groups, um, I can't imagine camping out here today as the protesters didn't, did back then, particularly um, in the way that they were legally sanctioned and made and and, and the police made space for the protesters and actually kept them and different uh, areas and pockets to keep them separated uh, for their safety, uh, not just the safety of the, uh, let's say, the status quo or the residents. Um, the protesters in 72 were camped out here for many months as well uh, in Flamingo Park, a short walking distance from the convention center. Uh, and we'll take that walk in just a second to give you an idea. Um, it was a large group. Um, just to give you an idea, uh, there were Marxists, uh, gay rights uh, liberation activists. Um, they were members of the Black Panther Party, feminists, hippies, and uh, the other known as the Zippies and Yippies, all very different from each other. If you don't know the separation, look it up, it's rather interesting. Uh, there were also members of the Students for a Democratic Society uh, there was the Attica Brigade, the uh, Vietnam veterans, of course, against the war, uh, what was known as the right Route 1 Brigade, uh, generally the pacifists, and as well as hundreds of, of other independent groups, maybe less tied to, to the, Viet, uh, the cause of the Vietnam War uh, specifically, but also kind of taking up space, uh, such as uh, Cuban liberation uh, activists. Here you have a, an image of uh, Jane Fonda, one of the many well-known uh, speakers that came here throughout those two months to speak directly to the protesters who had uh, traveled from all across the country uh, to be here in this rare event, again, of having both the, the Democratic and the Republican National Conventions in one city. Uh, reports from the time state that fights and disagreements would break out over rampant sexism, including attempted rapes, and, bet between, and between those who were part of the gay liberation movement and the, the straight protesters. Police and government officials worked hard to keep the protest groups apart, designating separate demonstration routes to avoid clashes, uh, different spaces uh, within the park, and all of this uh, you can check out in Seymour Gelber's uh, memoir of the time called uh, The Summer That Changed Miami Beach. Now with nearly two months of occupation here in, in, in Flamingo Park, the number of protesters in South Beach grew dramatically. And with it, you could say they're organizing their anger and their passion. And on August 22nd, the day Nixon would be nominated for re-election, roughly 3,000 protesters demonstrated. They got to the streets on South Beach and walked from here uh, where their encampment was up to uh, a couple blocks north to the convention center. We're gonna take that walk now 
And as I walk, we're going to kind of see the park, try and understand how the park has maybe changed. Uh, I, I, I think of what's important to note, if I just do a quick pan around here, is this is an entrance, a south entrance to the park. And you'll notice that uh, there's all these royal palms. There's uh, lots of sidewalk kind of uh, carving out areas um, so that you don't have to walk on the grass, God forbid. Um, you have uh, parking lots, you have um, lots of uh, folks passing by on, on bikes. Uh, so it's a, it's a very different uh, situation. Also of note is the, the prevalence of, of palm trees uh, uh, tends to limit the amount of, of canopy you get, right? So you don't have many areas with shade, which uh, I would imagine was a different case back then. I can't, um, you know, I can't imagine all those protesters uh, kind of here uh, camping in this summer heat, uh, which wasn't quite as hot as it is today, but it was fairly hot. Um, I'm going to put these sunnies on. Yeah, let's go for, let's go for a quick walk. Or not so quick, actually, because um, we're going to go all the way up to the convention center. Now, there are some stories uh, that have been told about uh, the park and the area and the interactions that took place between. Uh, Park, uh, the pro protesters here, and the many Jewish retired residents of the time that were living in the area. And uh, there's stories about how they would come here and, and have, you know, discussions in the day with them and really find common ground, um, as well as all the way to the point where there are some reports that they assisted the protesters in various ways. Um, my my favorite of which is is that uh, the these uh, residents would hand over and help out the protesters, giving them old uh, or unused furniture to help them with barricades and and keeping police uh, out of streets and alleys uh, while they were protesting. I think something interesting that I've just be, having lived in Miami for for a couple of of years now, uh, the um, the changes in this area. So this area was a lot more open just a couple years ago, and now what you've gotten is a combination of of um, of sidewalks and a lot more trees, mostly. Um, or I'd say like half, half of them are palm trees, which again, don't provide as much canopy as, as uh, other trees. So you have, you have quite a variation now of trees. And I think the city's finally realizing, um, shout outs to, to Omar, who's in charge of urban forestry. Uh, the city's finally realizing that, uh, palm trees look great in, uh, in, uh, on Instagram, but they, they're not so great in person. Uh, and also non-indigenous uh, for, for those who don't know. So like I was saying, this area used to be a, an open area. You could, you know, I can imagine this open area. So if you imagine it without the, the, the sidewalks, without many of these trees, without these um, lamp posts uh, to light the dark at night, keep you safe, uh, you and your, your pooch safe um, while you walk through here. Um, this area, I could imagine, you know, as an open area, would make a great space for, um, for an encampment, uh, would make great, a great space for uh, someone like uh, Jane Fonda to come and speak to a, a, a group of, of uh, student protesters. And now what you have is, is, is a kind of more individual uh, experience 
Um, so you have to wonder why, why is that the case uh, now? Why do we, uh, why are these individual uh, moments um, and striated situations encouraged? Uh, how is this built environment uh, changing and, and how has that change influence, been influenced by uh, big moments that kind of stay in the minds of, of, of folks in power, like the 72 protests, right? Um, so we're just gonna keep, keep walking, keep seeing. And also, I mean, of course, we also have uh, hills now, which were, weren't here before. Uh, there's been a movement uh, of the land, which also has to do with uh, sea level rise and the ability to 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 control uh, or, or or influence the the push or the flow push the flow of water uh, accumulation that happens here. Now to talk a little bit more about those protests. Um, some, uh, some protesters uh, who clashed uh, with, with the police in those days, uh, they, um, you can see some images here, or a image rather, um, here. Uh, they did so uh, with uh, theater. They did so with um, performances and, and artworks. Um, some demonstrators would uh, paint their faces a, uh, a kind of deathly white, uh, and they um, did a series of guerrilla street theater productions uh, that uh, you'll see in a news clip uh, that I'll play just after this. Um, they would protest um, and, and yell at uh, delegates that were arriving at the convention center. Um, this specifically reminds me of, of some recent protests uh, that uh, the group Extinction Rebellion has put on, pictured here. Um, and delegates are reported to have arrived uh, to the convention center crying and hysterical. More than 200 anti-war protesters were jailed that day. Uh, this despite the fact that officers were coached prior to protesters' arrival with a six-week human relations uh, course. <clears throat> okay, so now we're gonna take a walk to give you a sense of, of, of how to, uh, to give you a sense of the distance, right? From, from the park uh, to, uh, to the convention center.
protest march from Flamingo Park to uh, Miami Beach's senior high school uh, in the grounds of which the National Guard is camped. Uh, they are now on uh, the so-called Lincoln Mall uh, here at Miami Beach. Uh, they're, uh, they're en route there to, they say, talk to the National Guard. Their line of march uh, goes very near the convention hall here, uh, but uh, there is no, uh, there's been no indication from them that they intend to demonstrate at the hall itself. So we're now coming into the um, Lincoln Road area, a bit of a, a kind of midway point, you could say, uh, between the protest camps and the, the, uh, the convention hall or convention center. Um, I found it interesting to stop here for many reasons, but I think particularly uh, because this all this built environment has also been affected quite a bit by by many things, uh, including uh, the flow of capital uh, versus or in opposition or in contrast to uh, the wants and needs of of people. Um, here in front of me, I think is a great example of a building that's changed quite a bit over the last hundred years of its, of its existence. Um, originally a uh, department store, uh, a Macy's or a Burdines, and then uh, at some point uh, becoming a, uh, an artist residency uh, run by what was then known as Art Center in South Florida. Um, and now today, is um, a multi-use building um, after its sale, uh, including a Skechers and a restaurant uh, upstairs. Um, and you could see um, that restaurant uh, just up there. So they built on top of it to add it, to give it another layer. Um, okay, so now we're gonna uh, continue on uh, to the convention center. Uh, I might take a break uh, with the camera. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna take a break with the camera um, and uh, show you uh, a clip while I do this, the rest of this walk. Um, and I'll see, you, I'll see you on the other side. Some of the young people who oppose President Nixon and his policies have been demonstrating today outside the convention hall. More than 200 were arrested in a confrontation with police, and others are still demonstrating this evening. Say there were about more than 200 uh, pulled in after Chief Rocky Pomerantz of the Miami Beach Police decided that they were interfering with the rights of citizens. As they marched outside the convention hall this evening, they were staging guerrilla theater portraying what they call the Street Without Shame, which is the old French name for Highway 1 in Vietnam. They had an elephant pulling a large black coffin, a variety of other floats, allegedly symbolizing the atrocities in Vietnam. At one point, they set fire to an American flag. The Miami police stepped in and rescued the flag, or what was left of it. Some of the demonstrators also lay down on the streets, meaning to symbolize the results of the American bombing, but it also blocked traffic lanes at a time when delegates were heading for the convention hall. So we have uh, made it back uh, to the convention center. Uh, yeah, on the east side and 
we are, yeah, I'm still kind of noticing the changes, you know, that have occurred here. Uh, definitely uh, of note is uh, when you look at images, how the, each time uh, the convention center has expanded, it's, it's expanded into the street and more out than, uh, as close as it can get, you know, basically to to uh, to Washington Avenue here. Um, this this uh, this street, like I said, is you know the primary location uh, for uh, not only the the entrance of the convention center, but also uh, the protesting that happened uh, back in uh, 1972. Um, and uh, one of my favorites, I think, protests of that time that happened, uh, our favorite, my favorite, so a weird word to use, right? But uh, notable, let's say, um, an interesting uh, tactic here was uh, uh, this uh, this use of uh, sandbags, uh, which was oh, I made it a virtual. Well, I'm in the I'm in the protest, guys. <laughs> I accidentally used a, a virtual on this stuff, uh, but uh, anyway, it gives you it gives you the idea. Uh, maybe I'll give him a hand. Uh, when I'm done. Uh, but so this, you know, I this is uh, using uh, kind of found materials uh, essentially to to create the line uh, you can see the <laughs> the entrance of the uh, the convention center right there you see the title uh, the outside title card and uh, so this was again trying to kind of keep uh, trying to uh, keep the, the delegates driving uh, into the, the convention hall and from casting their votes uh, ostensibly for for Nixon, we all know how uh, that ended up. He was nominated again. Um, now, it's off, and uh, so now I'm. Uh, um, thinking about uh, the chance, uh, no justice, no peace, which is still heard. It was heard then, it was heard before 1972, and it's still heard now, uh, 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 protested nationally and probably internationally. I haven't done much, um, I haven't seen much uh, protesting in other countries. Um, but uh, yeah, no justice, no peace. Uh, and it reminds me the simple phrase of, um, back in 1972, when that's exactly what uh, the, the city of Miami Beach was uh, uh, saying it was going to provide uh, the Democrats and the Republicans for their convention peace, right? Um, they uh, had uh, hosted a very peaceful, you know, some would say boring, um, although at least on the outside, it was boring. On the inside, it, was, it definitely wasn't. It was, you know, as they were nominated, Nixon, who would go on to win. Um, the uh, Democratic National Convention, on the other hand, had occurred uh, in Chicago. Uh, and that definitely was not a peaceful protest. Um, now, the Miami Beach's then city manager, Clifford W. Oakey, promoted his city to the convention officials saying, in 1968, we demonstrated our ability to handle flawless a national political convention. Our formula for success is a perfectly balanced com combination of expert professional talent and outstandingly fine facilities. The same professional staff and improved facilities that we had in 1968 are intact today. And Speaking to that even further, here's a clip of uh, Pomerantz, the uh, police chief at the time, uh, talking to a reporter about uh, just this, this piece that they were going to do and how they were going to do it. 
first there's the peace and tranquility of the whole community that's at stake. Uh, secondly, there's a concern for the rights of the delegates to pursue the objective for which they've been selected. And thirdly, there's a regard for the rights of the protesters who dissent in a peaceful manner. Uh, our approach is that uh, all of these rights uh, should be protected in an effective and humane manner. And in addition, I guess one of the keys is that the police need not be an abrasive quality in this picture at all. So what changed is the question. Uh, why was Miami Beach not uh, uh, peaceful this time around? Uh, just four years later, what, what, what I think the key thing that changed is that four years later, we had a continuation of the atrocities at, in Vietnam and a White House and, and a party that said they were going to uh, change that and they didn't change that. So all of a sudden, you have an unpopular war grow, uh, having exponentially grown more unpopular and both parties uh, that arguably were uh, to blame in the same city only two months apart. Now at this very uh, space, uh, we have uh, another image that I want to share with you. Uh, and it's pretty much exactly where I'm standing. Uh, perhaps, I mean, not in the middle of the street. Uh, but uh, otherwise, this is exactly where this was taken. A line of police uh, keeping uh, some protesters at bay, more than likely to allow for delegates to arrive uh, to the Republican National Convention. So now, uh, let me get rid of this. Uh, we're going to be linking in a, a dear friend of the Department of Reflection, uh, someone many of you might know. Um, let's see if we can. Hello? Jenna, welcome to. Uh, Fieldwork Dispatches, it's great to see you. Um, it looks like you're over at uh, the uh, City of Miami Beach uh, Police Department. Um, yeah, so, so uh, for those who don't know, Jenna uh, has lived uh, here in Miami for most of her life, and actually she's a, a rare uh, multi-generational Miami. Uh, been here, for, her family's been here for many years, and Jenna is a local activist and artist. Uh, her work includes being the, the front woman of one of my favorite bands in town, uh, Don C, who's a, a, a post-punk band uh, on the rise. Uh, they're doing great things. Uh, so a question before we get into your presentation, Jenna, is uh, what are, are your experiences? What's your history uh, with organizing, direct action, civil disobedience? Maybe speak about how that has informed your art practice. And also, I think what's really interesting is your family history. Um, you, you mentioned in some private conversations about a, a, um, a protest you did in Bicentennial Park and how that had a direct line to your family. Uh, so maybe, yeah, just give us a little bit of background. All right, hi. So I guess I'll start with um, my family stuff. So I've been here a long time. My family moved down here from Jacksonville um, in the early 20th century. <laughs> and um, they were responsible in part for dredging the Miami River and 
um, back in the 90s when I first started protesting. One of the earliest protests I was a uh, part of was at Bicentennial Park to stop the Marlins baseball stadium from being built there. Um, and at the time, my dad was still alive and he found an image of the of that park when we used to have a marina that was there, one of the marinas along the river. And and yeah, I he like made my like protest sign with a picture from like our family, like, you know, don't put a baseball stadium here, there's history here, it should be like an open area where people can enjoy the water. So that's kind of where that started. Um, and I mean, I've pretty much been an activist for as long as I can remember. Can you hear me still? Okay. Uh, yeah, I've been an activist for as long as I can remember. Um, even as a child, you know, I was very aware of the environment and aware of like, you know, simple things when you're little, it's like, don't pollute, you know, or like, maybe we can walk there, just like little stuff like that. And as I got older, I became aware of, you know, civic engagement, um, protesting, attending um, meetings at City Hall, writing letters to commissioners, mayors, and most of it was really focused on the environment, uh, public space, historical preservation. Um, I was pretty involved in the, uh, the urban development line back when they went, you know, they still want to, but like push more into the everglades. Um, I was really against that and tried to do a lot of work for that. And now, fast forward to 2020 and it's another, um, so I think it's a good time for change, mm -hmm. Black Lives Matter. And, you know, I've definitely been going to the protests, mm -hmm. engaging in civic disobedience where I can. Um, I'm just trying to do my part as much as I can as a white woman with the privileges that I have, using my privilege in constructive ways and not just being comfortable part of the oppression. <laughs> yeah, uh, thanks for that explanation and that history. I think it's, it's really fascinating and uh, gives a lot of um, insight into to where you're coming from right now, um, literally and figuratively, <laughs> as we see a bit of your background. Uh, here, and 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 just one last thing, I, you know, I, I don't want to over over introduce you, but uh, I I noticed we have a question in the chat uh, from from a dentist. There's no last name here, um, but uh, Dennis asks, uh, you know, and I think it's interesting considering your your um, your background that you just explained, and particularly how you've gotten involved in, in more, more kind of civic. Uh, uh, engagement, political, the political process locally. Um, and he asks, Dennis asks, do you still think protesting uh, does anything for sociopolitical progress? And, and if you could explain your position. I am back. So. I think it absolutely does. I think that's actually been one of the biggest strengths that you know we have right now is that people are coming together. You know, we're uniting through our differences to you know say like no more. You cannot be violent against black people anymore. This oppression is ridiculous, and we're using our bodies, our physical bodies, in space. Um, mm -hmm. to say no and I think it's really powerful right now because you know there's so much there's so much presence on the internet and the media and everything feels so far away and that's kind of how it's felt for a long time like what are we fighting for where are we how are we connected and now it's like we're actually seeing each other you know and we're like 
there's a message of like, look around you. These people are, are fighting the same fight. You know, you're all leaders. You can all like, you know, take this as far as you can. And you can go harder and you need to go harder, you know? And so I, I 100% believe that um, protesting is efficient and, and crucial right now to remind us that we're all like, that we're all alive and there's a reason to fight. Beautiful. Well, yeah, thanks. Thanks for that heartfelt response. I, um, uh, I think I think we're ready to, to, to see your presentation. Um, I think just uh, go, go ahead and take over the mic and, and go for it. Thank you, Jenna. Uh, <laughs> appreciate it. We all appreciate it. Um, yeah, I think uh, I'm gonna uh, just kind of let your performance speak for itself there. Um, I, I'm sure I'll see you soon. I hope you're doing well during this, these, these times that you know we don't we don't see each other as often as we used to. But it's good to see you here virtually. Um, uh, yeah, so, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll call you later. <laughs> Thank you so much. Take care. Bye. So before we close, uh, I, I wanted to just address, uh, uh one, uh, Let's see how many. Oh, we only have one in the chat. We're only one question in the chat. Uh, it's from uh, someone anonymous, and they're asking, uh, I'm, I'm confused about your message. Are you for civil disobedience or not? Uh, well, uh, to close, I just wanted to, to, to say, um, 
thank you for being here um, and uh, that we've put this together for the entirety of the municipality, but particularly for the Department of Election Supervision, uh, the chamber, uh, the mayor, the governor, the president, um, as well as uh, historical preservation, which is really key thing uh, here. Uh, all of this in the service of, of not uh, uh, repeating uh, cyclical behavior. As always, our dispatches are independently funded, uh, guided, and researched in order to present the most unbiased and objective information as possible. Uh, and our sources today, uh, which have to be credited, are the Miami Herald, uh, History Miami, uh, Miami Beach uh, the City Clerk, Clerk's Office, uh, and uh, lastly, the State Library and Archives of Florida. Um, I'll close uh, with uh, this uh, image and, and the clip. Uh, the image, of course, uh, um, reminds us of how the, oh, I did a virtual. How, uh, reminds us of how the, not only the convention that was uh, so contentious and the, the protests and the, uh, and the election subsequently, but also the, um, the presidency. Uh, we all know how it ended. If you don't, uh, with you that real quick. And uh, here's a clip um, to close us off. Thank you again. Bye bye. No, I'm, I'm leaving. Sorry. Jeez. When the final gavel fell, the delegates, alternates, reporters, commentators, technicians, and party staffers all left the hall for the last time. And the same people who set up the conventions moved in to tear them down, to pack them up and clear them out, to get the center ready for the next convention, exposition, or special event. Tourism and convention business is what the economic life of this area is all about. When Miami Beach is not in the middle of one meeting, it's getting ready for the start of another. For seven days in the summer of 1972, the world looked at Miami Beach, and what they saw was the ritual and grandeur of American politics, the free expression of the full range of contemporary social thought. They saw two political events of enormous scope and importance, saw them take place just as they were planned, because the entire community took the time and the trouble to make sure they went well. Miami Beach, it's always been America's best-known resort. Now it's also America's best-known convention city.